It's, uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce you to Dr. Milton Long, who will be the, the last speaker this morning before lunch. Um, it, it really is a great pleasure and honor because uh, I've known him for over 30 years. Uh, he was the first to establish, a, one of the first to establish a clinic in, in uh, Asia and had the first baby in Hong Kong in 1986. And his talk will be about is there a clinical utility for immature oocyte collection and a vitro maturation in infertility. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you uh, for the introduction, my friend Jack, and thank you, uh, <clears throat> John Zhang, for inviting us uh, to come here. Um, it's a switch from the rest of this uh, talks from this morning because now we're going a little bit into uh, clinical work and. Uh, uh, John asked me to talk about the, whether there's still a, uh, <clears throat> a place for IVM you know, in uh, human infertility. And uh, at first, you know, it seems like a, a fairly simple answer. And the simple answer of most clinicians is that no, not really. Uh, but then, you know, I take a look and uh, we find that, you know, maybe, you know, I will just give a brief uh, talk now on history, the past, the present, and a little bit, you know, about the future. I'll leave, actually, the clinical part and the data, you know, uh, because Dr. S.L. Tang is here, and he's, you know, really one of the pushers, you know, clinician-wise, to make IVM uh, a standard uh, treatment some years ago for PCO, and therefore I leave, you know, the, uh, that part uh, to him uh, for tomorrow. So at the moment, you know, I'm going to skip the first few questions because I think most of the audience here is actually not clinicians, and uh, so I'm not going to ask you whether you still use IVM or whether IVM you think is. Uh, so the current status of IVM, I think, you've got to look at this in that in human being, IVM, you still look at it as a concept, it's something that we should be doing. It's a laboratory technique, you know, that we can somehow you know, either get immature oocytes or we can rescue you know, the, the, uh, in the egg collection when we don't have uh, enough um, mature oocytes, but then we have a few uh, GVs and immature oocytes. Whether we can do that is a laboratory technique, but it's not a standalone treatment in modality. You know, we have to think about this, that IVM is just a part of the process that we prepare you know, the old size so that they can go on to be fertilized and to be developed into embryos. And it's very widely used in animal product reproduction, but it's really underused in humans. So, like 30 years ago when we started doing IVF, there's, uh, the IVM now, you've got to look at it as a treatment tool waiting to be universally applicable because very few people use it, very few people really, very few, few lab can use it efficiently. So at the moment, there's some sort of alchemy. You know, some labs does it very well. Some labs really, you know, have a zero percent maturation. And there's also unresolved issues like IVM 30 years ago that needs to be clarified. So the, we have the technical part, the time of egg collection. When shall we do egg collection for IVM treatment? Is that IVM treatment? Is IVM preparation? What about the aspiration technique? You know, what about, is there drugs to use? You know, any priming, there's HCG priming, you know, to uh, help maturation. And there's also FSH priming, you know, to make the, um, um, the uh, follicles to be a little bit bigger so it's easier for egg collection. But uh, then comes the argument that once you start using FSH, is it still IVM or not IVM? Laboratory, there's maturation systems, culture media, there's no uh, uniformity, and uh, there's, uh, recently, I'm going to later to say, there's some more study into the laboratory way. Outcome, how do, com how do we compare IVM uh, with conventional IVF techniques? and safety, you know, that we tried many, many years ago when we started doing IVM in the early 90s, you know, SL10, myself, and a group of people, we tried to set up IVM registry, but of course, you know, they're the really you know, hardly um, successful, and uh, 
baby registry, again, you know, there's sporadic, we'll, we'll come to this, and you see the numbers are very small, and of course, long-term genetic changes, health issues of IVM babies. In this, if you, if you look at this slide, you say, this is what we asked about IVF 30 years ago, exactly. So, there's an ASRM opinion paper on 2013, and the summary, you know, is you can't read, it's just, you know, it says, uh, says at the end, IVM should be formed as an experimental procedure, and it's not, you know, to be considered as a clinical uh, treatment. The only thing that they highly recommend would be, you know, for some people with PCO risk and <clears throat> uh, for fertility preservation. So what are the current criticisms of IVM? Firstly, we have very inconsistent pregnancy rates. The pregnancy rates, as I said, you know, reported pregnancy rates are the, in the low teens you know, to the um, mid-40s and mid-50s, just like IVF. There's inconsistent clinical data regarding the timing of egg collection and the medium preparation egg collection techniques. There's inconsistent laboratory details regarding the egg collection culture system and culture techniques. And also, because you know, there's a great inertia, IVF is very successful, so um, is IVM is still experimentation. And there are problems in validating IVM because really you know, the numbers of babies born are small, and uh, the follow-up uh, in very small numbers, we're looking at reports of IVM babies born, you know, usually in the 20s, 30s, and 40s. Uh, the larger series is not, is only about 20, uh, 200 uh, patients. So there's genetic and epigenetic studies, epigenetic, what we worried about because with the IVM, we worry about methylation, we worry about, you know, whether there's any changes, you know, that can cause, you know, to the, um, but on the other hand, if we look at IVF, ICSI, PGD, PGS, in the beginning, the numbers are also very small. And yet, we accepted and we adopted, you know, these techniques, you know, to be a conventional and to be a uh, continued treatment. And now, you know, all this um, uh, basic IVF, you know, we do, ICSI is a basic uh, process, PGD, PGS nowadays, you know, is you know, really a very popular technique. You know, I was recently told that 40% of uh, USA um, IVFs have PGS done. So you know, this, this PGS is now a part of a normal process, not even a laboratory technique. So, but if we think, and whether is there a place for IVM in terms of the importance of doing IVM, and we can see that a lot of the reproductive data derived from animal studies. And whether animal studies can be really uh, put back into human being, we're not quite sure. But IVM, I think the, there is a place and there's importance, is that it's the only way we can study how human oocytes behave and how human oocytes become usable and fertilizable. So, you know, personally, I think whether we use it clinically as a first-line treatment, but there's importance of helping and studying IVM. And briefly now for the second part, I'll go on and review a little bit about the history of IVM. It's nothing new. You know, the Pinkers in the 1340s, Rock Chen, Mang in the 1940s, you know, and in, uh, in 1965, you know, Edwards, you know, wrote, you know, the paper that's now the, one of the uh, most quoted paper on IVM, uh, 65. And then uh, there's human application, you know, uh, Edwards, the group, you know, Edwards, Cambridge, Edwards, Steptoe, 1960s to 70s work on IVM and uh, GVs. Uh, from mouse, from different animals, and ended up in, in an IVF baby in 1978, in, but it's not from an IVM baby, but it's the, <coughs> the study from IVM, you know, from Edwards Group, you know, so make IVF a success. And Lucinda, in 1988, 84, Lucinda Fier is 
uh, credited you know, with the first uh, baby that's born from, IV, uh, from IVM uh, is uh, <coughs> from uh, the new, uh, right here in New York. And Char 1991, Charles in 94, and uh, Char and Chin in 95 all produce single or a few babies to prove as a proof of concept that it worked. And it's really not until 1990s, you know, when R.C. Chen uh, went from um, China, Tokyo, uh, China, Japan, Korea, then you know, to um, uh, Canada and uh, Toronto, and finally ended up in Montreal, that he designed a laboratory a way, you know, to the to get the media to be successful. And of course, then the, the Chin and Tang team in McGill make it at that time, now the glorious years, you know, and that is the tame, the OHSS beast. At that time, you know, there's the, this, we have to develop that because OHSS is becoming a big problem. So, <clears throat> well, you've all, you know, dabble in it for, you know, for those 10, 12 years, you know, until, um, and then of course, once we develop IVM uh, better, we find that we can use it for over responders, poor responders, and, and then in the uh, early, uh, late 19th, early, to, to, uh, early 20th century, when get into the milder IVF, you know, and of course, you know, that, inclu that included using IVM to increase the number of um, fertilizable oocytes and preservation fertility. Now, so we can use now I, uh, IVM to do a so-called milder preparation to collect both the large and small follicles and we use IVM to to mature the smaller follicles to be fertilizable. So you can use a smaller dose, sometimes even just using chromaffin and doing egg collection when the leading follicle is about 14, 15, and you, can, you end up you know, with uh, one or two M2s and a group of mix M1s and GVs, so you, sometimes you can have more oocytes actually than you can use FSH in large doses. Oocyte preservation for uh, fertility, and of course we know that there's, so some people, especially for the, uh, for the most common, at the present time, the most common uh, treatment for fertility preservation, which is for the young uh, breast cancer patients, uh, they, are some, they are not uh, a lot of oncologists, you know, it would not allow the clinicians, IVF reproductive clinicians, to use um, stimulation, to use eutrogen stimulating drugs, and therefore IVM seems to be a fairly <clears throat> a good re result. Repeated f fertilization failures, resist ovarian resistance syndromes, empty follicle syndrome, all this you know, has reported to be held by IPM. And yet, and yet IPM is fading away in clinical practice because once OHSS is controlled by the modified uh, stimulation and once we use GNRH agonists to trigger and with drugs, you know, like uh, serotonin ag agonists to reduce the response, uh, then comes the second part when we can effectively and very successfully freeze all the embryos so that we don't replace embryos in the stimulated cycle, OHSS is m become minimal. Although still one can say that the only way to have zero OHSS is through doing IVM, but OHSS now is controlled to a bigger extent and no one you would use IVM, which is, of course, very difficult to do and very ineffective. The pregnancy rate is certainly lower. And then, 
comes controversy because when the when we use IVM to come to supplement or to complement milder stimulation, you know, there comes the argument and what is RV IVM? You know, once you have when you're talking about a mix of M two, M one, uh oocytes, you know, there's this really IVM and how do you know which one was the which one was the embryo that got implanted, you know, and um successful is it really you know from IVM process so now um, IVM is really really not in the mainstream clinical IVF but not forgotten because of this scientific contribution so I think IVM is still in the heart of basic science research as it as in vivo in doing in vivo study is impossible so it's the next best thing that we can get in mature oocytes and try to find out how oocytes do mature. And we apply now old stories to, uh, to get new answers and we're talking about delay maturation, we're talking about pre-maturation cultures to, before, we, uh, before we do IVM, additional of maturation moderators, an understanding of the energy requirement, etc. And of course, then with all this recent development, we have to look at and say, can maturation medium and technique be standardized so that it can have a more general clinical application again? And this is my friend, R.C. Chin, he's not here. You see, you see SL10 tomorrow, but this is uh, R.C. Chen. And R.C. Chen really you know, is the person who, his first contribution is the uh, reported in 2000 that adding HCG priming will have an improved IVM result. Then he literally trotted around the world to teach IVM in England, in France, practically in, in Asia, practically everywhere. So SL10 took up Chin's work and made the clinical application. He led the McGill team, and the McGill team in, the, in this, uh, from late 90s to now, has contributed upwards of 200 papers in all aspects of IVM. It uh, worked out the PCO protocol, set up culture medium, it's a Sage McGill system, um, egg collection techniques, cook, all these things um, SL will talk about tomorrow. And this is the, all the first successes that the McGill Reproductive Center has produced. What about outcome? You know, we cannot talk about a technique you know, that is clinical treatment without outcome. So we have to look at this, and, and this is why you know, I want you to see that the numbers, oops, sorry, uh, bum, bum. Numbers are extremely small. You know, you talk about 20 single times, four twins, 48, 47 pregnancies, 40 pregnancies, 21 seconds. And even in this highly regarded and frequently quoted, most frequently quoted paper on IVM outcome, we only talk about 55 IVM, this is a McGill data, 55 versus 217 uh, IVF and 180 um, ICSI. So we're only talking, you know, with this slide, we're only talking, you know, maybe about uh, 400 cases. The next large series is just more recently produced, you know, by Chin, and we have 1,400 uh, cases. And then we can see, in, in actual fact, you know, that there's a lot that that it is rather you know, like routine, and the results, you know, have uh, the results are very sort of acceptable and, and safe. And if we look at other, pre, uh, other, prese uh, other presentations in the literature, your malformation rate you know, it's, uh, in, seems to be increased in Charles' report in 2005, and, uh, and, uh, <clears throat> and Attila report in 2006 with uh, neuromotor um, development that there was delay in first year and uh, catch up in second year. Mikkelsen 
the three thousand on forty-seven babies, you know, with uh, uh, normal uh, karyotype, but you know, with those, and the chromosome abnormality. So they are. It's not. It's not. Uh, this, it doesn't seem to be differ from normal pregnancies too, uh, too much, but you know, this, uh, uh, there are abnormalities. And this is a very interesting report recently from France. You know, it reported that, and again, you see this 38 cases, first 38 cases of IVM versus IVF. But it says, you know, that, you know, the, in this, uh, this, uh, Weight, you know, the IVM babies are weight more than the IVF babies. And, but, you know, they seem to catch up. And this is very interesting that the girls show significant difference in all of this. And so the sex differences is difficult to explain. The more weight, you know, seems to do with, you know, with uh, what Aflin had talked about, you know, that the... Um, the um, artificial or the, the IVM uh, animals, anyway, you know, in cloning and things that are bigger animals. So you know, so IVM is a little bit heavier, and um, and um, but the girls, you know, the IVM girls are much bigger and taller. Is it due to the um, and, exp and especially in PCO? Uh, PCO patients, is it due to androgen? Um, we don't know. There's no answer to this. Anyway, the this, this study is very small. So, Nogira also reported that he, they look at 30 embryos and only 7% were normal. So, there's, there's a, some, maybe, you know, in the early days and in some, in some laboratories, um, culture system, you know, there seems to be more abnormal cases. So we have this already. So the conclusion of this part is that it simplifies the treatment, reduce costs, and eliminates OHSS. It can really be very cheaply done without, without the uh, stimulation, as we know that stimulation now most, uh, for most conventional IVF is about 40% to 50% of the cost of treatment. Uh, IVM is successful in women with high a AFC. If the AFC is more than seven, um, then, you know, then there's a good chance that you can do IVM or natural cycle with IVM or um, very mild stimulation IVM and you'll get you know, very good uh, clinical results. We know that XGG priming increases the final of um, and then IVM is helpful women with repeated poor embryo quality uh, in previous IVS for no uh, for the un unexplained. Uh. And here is the problem: you know, the with good, in good hands, IVM produces clinical pregnancy rate, you know, of first thirty-five percent upwards in women up to thirty-five. And this is you know definitely comparable to uh, IVF. The perinatal outcome, you know, from Bucket, you know, and the uh, SNS group, we know that the perinatal outcomes are IVM pregnancy are comparable to IVF and ICSI. And it can be useful in PCO patients, reduce ovarian reserve and fertilization failures, etc. It can be useful for offset donation, it may offer a chance for fertility, fertility preservation for young patients and also for patients who should not be exposed to high estrogen. Now, after that, you know, I'm going to just use the next few minutes to talk about the recent changes and the recent looks at uh, improving IVM efficiency, IVM outcome. And you know, we're looking, you know, nowadays we're looking at addition of epidermal growth factors. You know, we're looking at brain-derived and, and glial cell-derived nuclear factors. And they express through the granulosa cells, you know, they do things by uh, regulating the cyclic AMP um, <clears throat> in the, in the um, oocytes to modify uh, maturity. 
And you know, we, we, if we look at you know the um, the I think maybe we should, okay okay the um, human embryos are you know are, numbers are very low, but you know in both in the cows you know there's usually there's more than four hundred thousand embryos uh, and four thousand oocytes used every year to produce cows. And so most of the IVM studies uh, that is now shifting, you know, or, or over tripping into human uh, USA IVM is basically from animals, and most of them are from cows. And we're talking about, you know, how the maturation cascade and the events affects USA maturation. And that is adenoid case increases. The main thing is to maintain the increase of CMP. And if we increase CMP, you know, then it will reduce the oocyte maturation inhibitor, and this will delay uh, meiosis resumption. And maintaining the me me meiotic arrest in oocytes will increase the chance, you know, of. Uh, of uh, meiosis resumption, uh, me increase the chance of uh, meiosis, and also, you know, maybe to synchronize the uh, nuclear and the cytoplasmic uh, dis dis dis-synchrony. So does retar ret retarding the maturation phase IPM, we, if we shorten the maturation phase, you know, then by using, for instance, uh, DMAP, it will lengthen the maturative phase. It shows in culture, so in human oocytes, there is an increased maturation rate, and there's no difference in fertilization and development of the embryos. And if we talk about, well, when we look at oxidative um, stress in IVM, then we know that you know the addition of um, addition of chemicals um, like uh, <clears throat> vitamins, amino acids may help IVM. So that's uh, anything that could reduce the uh, oxidative stress will help IVM in culture. But the more recently, you know, this concentration is called, is in the um, stimulated physiological oocyte maturation. And this is to look at the role of cyclic AMP and cyclic GD GMP and the nutrientic polypeptides. The aim is to hold on and to reduce meiotic resumption. And by reducing and delaying the meiotic resumption, you know, then we can cause a better response and better IVM rate and success. And this is the um, here you know, by using uh, inhibitors by using uh, stimulations uh, by reducing you know the cycle uh, up upholding the cycle AMP then we can delay this and become better um, uh, better results and this is the re the production by. Zhang, uh, Hai Tou Zhang, and this is the cascade you know, that we talk about to, to control a cycle AMP you know, in the cells, you know, so the nuclear resumption will be delayed. And so, um, and we use heparin uh, to, as to in the um, in the medium for egg collection, and recently. Um, Zhang Haitou has shown that the heparin in fact, is in fact reduces the maturation rate, and you know. So you know if you if if you so so we should not do heparin, and we should we should just use a normal flushing um, fluid if you do any flushing. Estrogen suppress uh, IVM. Um, this is reported by VTAC that if you use estrogen, you can reduce, you can improve the IVM result. And by uh, the maturation rate at 24 hours, 
fertilization, everything is better you know, with uh, estrogen prime. How about, uh, how about this, this may be in theory, so how about if it has this uh, stimulated physiological oocyte maturation be applied to human studies? And this is a you know, paper that's published re uh, in 2008. You know, we look at, when we look at um, the um, use of gelatamine, uh, which is uh, a phosphodiesterase, uh, uh, inhibitor, and this is a cyclic AMP, phosphorylene is cyclic AMP uh, activator. And by using this, um, the, um, it seems you know, that uh, the maturation rate is increased. And the more recently you know, ap application of, spont uh, of stimulated you know, physiological in human we have is show that it works, and uh, the uh, patients at least have two phase cycles, and with this indication, and the culture with this with CMP or moderate calcium uh, pre maturation for two hours, and then uh, applied the usual um, um, change the usual maturation rate. So the maturation is higher, the, but the pregnancy rate is 33 percent, and the oocyte maturation rates you know, it seem, also seems to be higher. And this is the, um, this is the most common thing, the most recent, most recent thing that they use in PCO patients. Uh, Zhang Haitou in, uh, in um, Guangzhou has um, shown that, you know, you can compare, you can compare standard IVM treatment with standard with induced IVM and the, um, the data, patient data are the same, but you know, in the uh, number of M2 is greatly increased. And here is the, oops, sorry. And the, Pregnancy rate is highly increased, and implantation rate is m much increased. And uh, this, you know, is in a, a fairly decent number. So it shows that. So maybe the press in present day, we've got to look at using modulators to help the IVM process. If I can take a look through the crystal ball, I say that IVM in human can be successful and safe as in animals. And the demand for more physiological IVF may change the clinician's practice finally to look at um, IVM. Less, air, less HCG will result in less, but maybe better oocytes. Improvement in culture will make IVM the white knight in certain cancer preservation. Egg donation and storage can play a big part. <coughs> Fertility preservation for young girls will be a reality when pre follicle IVM become clinical tool. And also with IVM supports artificial ovaries, augment I IVAs, stem cells may prove to be the real beef you know, in future uh, for, uh, reproductive treatment. Assisted reproduction may become an affordable option for all. Thank you.